was, of course, a prolific football player, now a prolific broadcaster tag teaming with uh, Jeff Joniak. Game time, long ball time, daily copy time. How are you doing, everybody? I'm Chet Kopic. Daily Copic, of course, brought your way by Carmichael's, the place for steaks, 1052 West Monroe Street. Stop in and lower the boom on that big Chicago cut, or maybe a ribeye as we join. Long time, buddy, Tom Thayer. Uh, it dawned on me, you and I have been doing this now for about uh, 25 or 26 years, so I have a very obvious question. Is there anything you want to ask me? <laughs> well, you started quite a bit before me, so I have yeah. not caught up to you, and I was thinking... Ironically enough, I was talking to Jay Hilgenberg about you last night about going to 61 years of Chicago Bear football. And in my sports Bears career, I'm always disappointed I never got to see a game in Wrigley Field. Could you see the modern day game being played in Wrigley Field if it was configured into a football stadium? No, the, uh, the game is just too fast. This Sunday, Bears in the Dome, you'll be down there, head to head against True Brees in New Orleans. Now, if the Bears do beat New Orleans, <laughs> you tell me how big the buzz is going to be with Green Bay coming to town the following week. It'll be the most meaningful Green Bay-Chicago game this early in the regular season that I can ever remember. And when you think about Green Bay's recent success and the Bears' recent success, but what Green Bay kind of derailed their ultimate goal, it'd be unbelievable, not only in a national audience, but in the close proximity that both teams are. The area would be bubbling. <laughs> Do you still hate, in your own way, the Green Bay Packers. I hate the logo, you know, and I always will. However, the guys that played for Green Bay that I have a chance to become friends with over the years, yeah, it's forgive and forget. But it's always nice to have those kind of memories at such an intense rivalry because as good as we were or as good as they were at different times along our career, it was always a great game. All right, my friend, uh, sell me, convince me that the Bears offensive line is going to last over 16 games. I'm not worried about them lasting. I know that this may be the strength of the team by the end of the season. When you look at the offensive tackle position, you've got two bookend tackles that could be here for the next 10 years and play at an extremely high level. Does Lovey Smith at this point in time have a right to uh, step in front of the microphone, step in front of the podium and say, all you naysayers who have doubted me over the years, look at my track record. I deserve more props. I think the best thing about it, he could stand up there and say that, but he doesn't have to because there's a lot of guys in the locker room that stand up and say that on his behalf, and they wouldn't need to be encouraged to say it. So I think that's more important. Lovey Smith is a heck of a football coach, and he knows, he knows how to coddle a lot of modern-day personalities that would be tough to survive in some locker rooms. Would Mike Ditka be a better fit for this team today, here in 2011, than Lovey Smith? For these, the players in this locker room? Yeah. No. I think, you know, people, even the response that Brian Kelly's getting at Notre Dame for all of his face gyrations is such a negative response from the media. If Ditka was doing that on the NFL sidelines of the day and grabbing people and dragging them around the sidelines, it wouldn't fit very well. With the new collective bargaining agreement, I think they put a Ditka clause in there. No grabbing on the sidelines. But from a football perspective, a guy who knows, a guy who's been there, where do you want to see Melton pick up his game? Um, <clears throat> Double-digit interior sacks, and it hasn't been had around here for a long time. And if you can get an interior defensive lineman to have 10 sacks or more, the outside guys are going to get a lot more. But he has the ability to do that. You know, it's more impressive to me is because this was talent recognized last year by Rod Marinelli, and he set his sights on developing Henry Melton into the player that he was and will be and should continue to be. He's got to put a lot of effort into it. I look at Matt Forte. His pass receiving instincts, very, very soft hands. Couldn't you, in fact, line this guy up as a slot receiver? Oh, easily, easily. And I know they, you know, they have formations that they split him out as a wide receiver. But the Bears are gifted in that position so they can use speed, and he's, he is a good uh, to deflect a lot of attention to him. But Matt Forte could play anywhere in the line of scrimmage. I think that's one of Matt's unique qualities is he's a football player, and he, can, he could line up anywhere. All right, my friend, uh, tell me why, based on certain matchups, again, as a football man, tell me why the Bears walk in the Dome on Sunday and upset Drew Brees. The Bears' defensive line can play faster up front um, when they can hear the opponent's snap count. It's hard to get into a rhythm as a defensive lineman and really jumping off the line of scrimmage when the crowd noise at home has taken the quarterback's cadence away. 
you can fall into a rhythm by listening to the way the quarterbacks repeatedly use their counter. They get a jump on this, this offensive line for New Orleans, it's really going to disrupt the entire flow of the New Orleans offense and the backfield and everything. So um, you brought up Henry Melton. You may see the best of Henry Melton this week. If Brian Kelly were here right now, he's 0-2. They've turned the rock over 10 times. Touchdown Jesus is, uh, is glaring right now. Uh, uh, the Rockney Monument uh, won't even give Brian Kelly the, uh, the time of day for heaven's <laughs> sakes. What, what advice would you offer a guy who is absolutely under siege, unlike any other coach in my opinion right now, in major college football, with the possible exception of Mark Richt down at Georgia? I would tell him to keep coaching the way he's coaching. It may not sound popular to the parents out there or the kids, but it's, the kids have to be more conscious of ball security when they're playing the game of football. If they don't fumble that first series on the three-yard line, the kid from South Florida takes it all the way back, Chris huh. may be, still be playing quarterback. You don't know that. The Bay, Notre Dame may have come out and won that game. However, you know, football is a game of tension, and it's an it's a every-play performance. So Brian Kelly doesn't stop coaching after one good play. He's already on to the next play, the next series, and the next down and distance, but he has to think about everybody's assignment. So, you know, I walk back to that same sideline for eight years and watch Ditka yell at me as I appro we approach the sideline. It, you know, that's part of coaching. And they always say when they stop yelling at you, that's when you got to be careful. Going back to 1992, you're in the dome. You just <laughs> go on a 17 or 18 play drive. You got a fat lead on Minnesota. Mike Ditka tells Jim Harbaugh one thing. Don't audible. Mm -hmm. What does Harbaugh do? He audibles. He gets picked. The Vikes go on a roll. He lose the ball game. Was there a part of you that was almost laughing while that was going on? No, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> I, you know, you start thinking about, you know, when you were playing for Coach Ditka and Dick Stanfell, our offensive line coach, and you'd go back and you'd watch tapes as a team, you would think about every bad play because it's really hard to sit there with your peers getting yelled at by the coaches the way you did for a missed assignment or, you know, just don't have a mental error. Maybe it's a physical <laughs> error, but, you know, it was all, you know, it was all, every day was challenging. So, you know, that's the way we lived life in football. Hey, my friend, the pleasure as always. Take good care of yourself and enjoy uh, life way down yonder. Thank you. I appreciate it, Copic. He is uh, Tom Thayer, longtime buddy, first class act. This has been the Daily Copic brought to you, of course, by my good friends over at Carmichael's, 1052 West on Monroe Street. Stop by just a drive and a half wedge from the United Center. Hey, if they can feed guys like Copic and feed guys like Thayer, believe me, they'll more than take care of you. Catch you next time around. So long, everybody.